Okay, uh, so we've already seen this beautiful factorization of any arbitrary M cross N complex matrix called the SVD, uh, which is to say that suppose you have matrix like so, we've seen that we can always write this matrix in the following form. Okay, where u is of size, what's the size of u? m cross m, right? v is also of size n cross n. So these are square matrices. And sigma, sigma 1, sigma 2 until sigma r, and then you have zeros elsewhere. Of course, this is real, right? And these are in fact the singular values of the matrix A. What's the size of this? What should be the size of this? M cross N, right? These are real numbers. Additionally, the important thing to note here is that sigma 1 is greater than or equal to sigma 2 until sigma r, which is strictly greater than 0, right? What else? What can we say about this u? These are unitary matrices, right? Which is to say that further, u Hermitian u is equal to u, u Hermitian is equal to an identity of size m and v Hermitian v is equal to v, v Hermitian is equal to an identity of size n, yeah, right? So we've seen this. Now in view of this, I shall now write this down in a slightly different form, okay, but one that you should be immediately able to relate to from this itself, which is to say that A is equal to perhaps I should denote it as something like this. So this is the summation, not the sigma, all right, this is summation i going from 1 through r, sigma r, u r, v r, Hermitian. Or rather, I think the other day I actually denoted these by y r's, right? Where of course, u is equal to y1, y2, so on, until yr, and then y tilde r plus 1, until y tilde, uh, what was the size of u? m. And v is equal to v1, v2, until vn, right? Clear on this? Why this is obvious? You see, what is this? The way I would write this expression down here, I can just stack up the columns side by side and then stack up the rows of V with their conjugations, one on top of the other, like so, right? And then this form results. You might wonder what happens to the remaining. I'm taking a sum from, oh, sorry. I should just say i, right? Yeah, that's a mistake. Yeah, that's a running variable. So I'm only taking r. You might wonder what happens to the rest. Well, the rest, if you look at this, turn out to have no weight except zero. So the columns of u past this yr, the rth column, 
Because what is sigma doing when acting on u? So if I just look at this much part of it, then every time I pick a column of the sigma, it's basically filtering out one column of u and scaling it by some factor. What is that factor? The factor is exactly the singular value. That's the amplification or the gain that's being applied to that direction. So directions beyond the rth direction, which is this, do not get amplified at all. They have gains of zero. Is it not? Right? So therefore, we can conclude that this sum will only run up to r. And this is beautiful because what this says is that this matrix A can be written as the sum of r rank 1 matrices. Think about a typical object like so, yi, vi, Hermitian. What does it look like? So this is yi1, yi2 until, what's the size of y? It's an m tuple, right? Yi m. And this is nothing but vi1 conjugate, vi2 conjugate times vi n conjugate. So the resultant is a matrix whose first row is just yi1 times this particular row. The second row is yi2 times this row. So every row is just a scalar multiple of another row. That means there's just one row which is linearly independent. All other rows are linear combination. In this case, it's precisely a scaled version of that one row. So this is a rank one matrix. Yeah. So the rank of each such object is obviously equal to 1. So in other words, what this SVD has allowed you to do is to write any matrix A yeah, as a sum of R rank 1 matrices. Sir, could you repeat the so rank of this matrix, this is called an outer product by the way, that's besides the point anyway. So the first row of this resultant is just yi1 times this row. Second row is yi2 times this row. So every row is a scaled version of this row. So there's just one linearly independent row. The row is spanned, the entire row span is spanned by just this row alone. So therefore the rank is equal to the dimension of the row span, which is equal to that. You can also look at the column picture. The first column is just vi1 conjugate times this. The second column is just vi2 times this. So the entire column span, the image is spanned by just this. Right? So each of these individual elements sitting inside the sum is just sigma i times this and sigma i is not equal to 0 for i running from 1 through r. Therefore, this is a sum of sum of r rank 1 matrices. And now go back to the question we had yesterday and um, the previous day where we said what is the best rank k approximation. So out of these rank r, is it not the case that you pick out the ones with the highest weights, right? You remember that rank k approximation of a m cross n matrix. That is what you did. You can just write it down as this, right? And then pick out the largest, the directions corresponding to the largest singular values, sigma 1 through sigma k, and just truncate it there, right? Now, why it works, again, we will not prove that, as I said in the previous day, but that is indeed a very uh, useful application of the SVD, which allows you to compress the amount of data contained in an M cross N matrix through just M plus N times R number of data points, right? So uh, as promised in the previous day, we shall now prove the fact that, and that this form is going to be very handy in proving that, that the kernel of A, or rather maybe I'll start with the image first. So the image of A is nothing but the span of y1, y2 till yr. So that is basically the first r columns of U will give me what exactly? The image of A. Now why is that so? So again, as we have done so many times previously, when we try to prove this equality of subspaces, we have to show containment both sides, right? So consider AV, 
yeah any object of this form av this definitely belongs to image of a hmm? all right so this is nothing but summation sigma i y i v i hermitian times v i going from 1 through r now this v comes from where it is an n tuple what is the basis for c n that is pertinent to us we have a basis for c n just like the columns of u are a basis for c m the columns of v do they not also by our very construction in the previous day have we not seen that the columns of v provide us with a ready made orthogonal basis or orthonormal in this case orthonormal set of vectors that form a basis for cn right so using that result i am going to write this as summation sigma i y i and then summation <coughs> v i hermitian alpha g v j so i'm just going to push this v i hermitian inside i could have kept it outside also but you see because the key is to get these v's to interact with each other where these v j's are what the columns of v okay columns of v is this clear so this essentially together with the summation is my v any vector v that i pick out in cn the n tuple of complex numbers can be represented as a linear combination of the columns of v because v is an orthogonal matrix therefore it form its column span not just span not just the arbitrary span they are actually given orthogonal basis for the uh, vector space that is cn right in that case what happens unless i is equal to j because of the orthogonality it's always going to be zero right please ask if this is not clear so this is where i'm saying j going from 1 through n right j is a second running variable the summation on j essentially captures v so maybe i should write v is equal to summation alpha j vj j going from 1 through n yeah clear so far please ask if there's any doubts all right now what do you think will be left behind because this vi is remember vi is fixed so when i'm operating with this vi all the alpha j's apart from alpha i have vanished is it not so each of these objects corresponding to an i only filters out one object from these vj's which is the ith object so next this sum becomes irrelevant because it's not going to be a sum after all after the, you carry out this inner product this is an inner product the conventional inner product on cn so after you carry out this inner product you are not going to be left with a sum anymore but you're just going to be left behind with alpha i and vi hermitian times vi is just unity because these are orthonormal basis so this entire thing just devolves to alpha i right so this is going to be summation alpha i sigma i y i i going from 1 through r of course then it stands to reason that this belongs to the span of or rather here i've used the other notation for span so this obviously belongs to the span of y1 y2 through until yr so one way containment is shown that the image is contained inside the span of this right no doubts on this so far any questions this is actually also a very interesting thing here you see 
especially if you're talking about signal processing and things like that. And if this corresponds to different channels, different directions. So if alpha i happens to be your gain along the ith direction, so your input could be some vector of signals and alpha i is the gain along the ith direction, then that is amplified by sigma i. So your output is along yi. For an input along vi, your output is along yi. So it exactly tells you that this vi is rotated in a certain way. Of course, uh, the spaces have changed. So your input is probably an n tuple and your output is an m tuple. So you cannot talk about it as a pure rotation in the same vector space. But if it's squared, of course, you can talk about it. So it's basically along the ith direction, whatever input you give with an amplification, with an amplitude of alpha i, that gets amplified by sigma i. And it is along the ith output direction, which is given by the vector u. So there's a very nice connection between these channels. A channel input along vi reflects in an output along yi with an amplification sigma i, right? So in, in, in the MIMO system, whether it's signal processing, whether it's in control theory, multivariable controls, wherever you come across these things, if you freeze the instant of time, then at every fixed instant of time, you have this sort of a thing happening, right? So this captures that phenomena very nicely. But anyway, our concern is not that. Our concern was to show this equality. And so far, we have managed to show the one-sided containment. So we have shown that the image of A is contained inside the span of y1, y2, through till yr, right? Now it's the time for the other part of the story. So what we now have to show is, does there exist V such that for all alpha 1, alpha 2 until, okay, so we are now going to cook up a spanning set for the y's, right? Alpha r, we have a solution to the equation, which equation exactly? That A V is equal to summation alpha i y i. Because if so, then doesn't matter what vector I pick out in the image or rather what a vector I pick out in the span, sorry, what vector I pick out in the span of these y i's, I can always represent it as the image of some vector under the transformation A, right? So if the answer to this question is a yes, if the answer to this question is a yes, we would have proved the other side of the containment. You agree? That's exactly how to look at it. But I would not, uh, you know, I would just use this step here. So any AV, if it has to satisfy that condition, what I'm asking for is this to equal this, is it not? So I'm saying summation i going from 1 through r, sigma i, yi, vi Hermitian v is equal to summation which is equivalent to this summation alpha i y i. Do you see what I'm going to do now? It's fairly obvious. I mean, I just require one solution. I don't care about a unique solution, you see. And in fact, there won't be unique solutions. Anything that maps, any, anything that gets mapped to this, you add something in the kernel of A, that will also map to this. So if the kernel of A is non-trivial, then there will be multiple solutions. But I am just happy with just any one solution, right? So let's just say that I choose, choose, yeah, so what is in my choice? I have my, in my choice this V, 
I am required to choose a particular V. So choose V such that the inner product of V with VI is equal to alpha I by sigma I. Can I do that? Well, of course I can because I am only looking for I is equal to 1, 2 until R for which I know that the sigma I's are all non-zero. Right? If I choose V in this manner, what happens? I mean, it's just a trick. The, 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 what, what would satisfy my deal was obvious from this step itself. See what's, what's happening. The projection of V along these principal directions is tailored in such a manner that what will happen? Yeah. So this VI Hermitian V is nothing but this inner product, no? So it is designed by, by my very design, it is meant to satisfy this equality. I can of course keep adding something more to this V as a linear combination of V R plus, I mean, uh, yeah, as in terms of the remaining terms in the vector in the matrix V, the remaining columns of V beyond the first R columns. But it won't matter, right? right? In fact, in our next part of the proof, we shall show that those columns of V will exactly be the kernel, the basis for the kernel of A. So they won't matter, right? So this choice, such a V satisfies, let's call this equation as star. So such a V satisfies star. So I was required to find a solution V such that for any given sigma uh, summation of alpha i, y i, I'd be able to satisfy the condition that a times v is equal to that. So anytime I pick out a vector in the span of the y i's, the first r y i's, the first r columns of u, I should be able to find some v that satisfies that condition. And now here I have at least one such solution, no claims for uniqueness, but at least this solution serves my purpose. Yeah, you'll see that, just plug it in. Just Understand that this is nothing but this inner product. Just plug it in here, alpha i by sigma i. So the sigma i and sigma i will cancel and you have the alpha i and that's it, right? The fact that these sigma i's are non-zero for the first r values, one through r, just works all the way for me. So in fact, you have the other sided containment as well, y1, y2 until yr. So anytime I pluck out a fellow from this span, it's also going to be part of the image of A. So what's the dimension of the image of A then? So the big statement is any rank R matrix can be written as a sum of R rank 1 matrices by your observation. This is a sum of R rank 1 matrices and the representation thereof A through this SVD is basically that of a rank R matrix. In fact, the number of non-zero singular values is exactly the rank of a matrix equivalently, right? When you're dealing with complex or real fields, it's the beauty of the singular value decomposition that allows you to deal with most properties of matrices in a very uh, I should say elegant fashion. Many of those properties are very apparently obvious, right? So now we will try and see how to characterize the kernel of A. So by rank nullity, what should be the dimension of the kernel of A? Yes. So it's an, remember M cross N matrix. So the ambient space from which it is mapping is N dimensional. Right? It's plucking out vectors. 
in its domain, which are n, n tuples of complex numbers. So it's n dimensional over the complex field. Yeah. So n is equal to r plus nullity or the dimension of the kernel. So the dimension of the kernel is n minus r. So the first thing about a is that the dimension of kernel a is equal to n minus r. Clear on this? This is from r n t, rank nullity theorem, straight away. Clear? No doubts about this, why this is n minus r? Right, because our v is now n dimensional, v is cn, right? Okay, now let us consider uh, v which is given by v1, v2 until say vr and then vr plus 1 till vn. Remember these are orthogonal set of vectors, right? So anytime I pick out consider a v k for k greater than r. All right. What can I immediately say? a v k is equal to summation sigma i y i v i i going from 1 through r times v k. right this is nothing but summation sigma i y i times v i inner product with v k i is equal to 1 through r what are these inner products remember i is going from 1 through r but k is something greater than r so due to the orthogonality, I would posit that this is 0. So each individual term in this summation is 0. Yeah, therefore this is 0. So this implies Vk belongs to kernel A. Whenever you take k greater than r, that V corresponding to that k, Vk, must belong to the kernel of A which means, which essentially means that we now have v k plus 1, v k plus 2 until v n, the span thereof is contained in kernel A, right? Each of them individually belongs to the kernel. So you take the linear combinations, which is what a span is all about, that will also belong to the kernel. But what is the dimension of this? What is the dimension of this? Isn't that a set of linearly independent vectors? I mean, they're orthogonal after all. So any set of orthogonal vectors, unless there's zero, there's no zero vector over there. So obviously it's linearly independent. So this span has n minus ah, so this should be r, right? Yeah, sorry, it should be r. Yeah, probably that's what you are pointing out. Yeah, thank you. So this must be r. So this must be equal to n minus r and the dimension of the kernel of A is also n minus r. So we don't need to show both sided inclusion here. All that we need to show is that this object is sitting inside this and the object sitting inside has the same dimension as the extension thereof. Hence, we must have kernel of A is equal to the span of v r plus 1, v r plus 2, all the way until v n, right? So basically the first r objects in the column span on the, in the, among the columns, the first r columns of u provide you a basis for the image 
of A and the last n minus r columns of V provide you with a basis for the kernel of A. Yeah, and not just any arbitrary basis, but these are orthogonal basis. So it's beautiful the way the singular value decomposition sort of characterizes any linear transformation. It gives everything in a very crisp and transparent fashion. But of course, you have to assume that you're dealing with complex or real matrices only. Right, because that's when this question arises, these inner products and these orthogonalities and all of this only makes sense, right? So with that, we'll bring the brief journey. Of course, there's lots more. I mean, singular value decomposition is probably one of the most useful factorizations you'll learn about matrices. But so obviously, it's, there's lots more that you can delve into and we can talk about this for hours on end. But we'll have to bring it to a close here because we have been a little waylaid from our main topic, which was the study of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So presently, we shall move into that domain. So here is where we shall put an end to our uh, brief journey into uh, singular value decompositions. Okay. So there and back again. Right.